Superlatives were invented to describe our next guest. World's best. Greatest. One and only. There is no list that he isn't on or has been number one. Today, we are in the presence of bartending royalty. I'm Susan Schwartz, your drinking companion, and this is Lush Life Podcast. Every week, we are inspired to live life one cocktail at a time by the best in the industry. I truly believe, even if Eric Lawrence hadn't seen that film on bartending when he was at school, he would have still risen to the top of whatever profession he chose. Lucky for us, it was behind that bar. For those of us living in London, we've been able to see his star rise through the Connaught as the 10th head bartender of the Savoy, and now at Quaint, his own place. Over two episodes this week and next, we'll discover how a boy from a small town conquered the cocktail world. This week sees what Eric accomplished to find himself at the doors of the Connaught Bar, and next week what happened after he stepped through those doors. But now, let's start at the very beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Originally from Slovakia. That's where I grew up. That's where I studied. And that's where I first time touch a cocktail shaker. Okay. And what, what were you studying? So I was studying actually uh, hospitality management. Did Back you always know that that's it for you? You wanted to be in hospitality? I, uh, so basically the how I got to that school was that... Uh, I used to play football with a very good friend of mine and he was older than me. So he already started in that school. And one day we had a meeting and he was doing his practice and he told me, he's like, come to meet me in this restaurant. And I see him at work first time. I was like, wow, this looks pretty cool. And that was the time when I had to kind of start making a decisions like which direction I want to go. After. How old were you? I was 17. So that's where you no, actually no, I was younger than that. No, I was 16. I was 16 when you start your high school. So I and I had to make my decisions like what I'm going to study, what I'm going to do next. Is and it like London or England different. where you have to pick one thing oh, and yes. go with it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You uh-huh. have to pick. So so when I see him working in the restaurant, it's like that's the kind of job I like to do. It's, it's pretty nice, clean and in a nice environment. It's like I think I want to be a waiter. I want to work in the hospitality. I want to study that. Now, were your parents in hospitality? No, no one. No one? No one, no one. I was the first. And they were pretty okay with that. They were just supporting. Okay, it's a nice school, clean. Because they couldn't see me working and doing a dirty job. That was my mom. It's like, my mom never wanted to do that. And I always liked to do that, you know, doing, being in a garage with my father or being in a garden, just like, always come back home dirty and my mom's like no 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 and when I choose that she was very happy about that <laughs> I love that she wanted you to be clean yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so when I started in that school when we were doing our practices so they were just like giving different introductions like what's the hospital about you have the front of us you have a back of house so front of us is this 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 and suddenly came to a topic or a bartender and cocktails so it's like hmm this sounds even more interesting than I thought this school was going to be about but that was just only like one or two lectures and that was it. But that had such a strong impact on me that I was like, actually, I just seen something so fascinating when I'm seeing in the TV this bartender because they show us a video like, oh, so this is a bartender and this is how bartender works. Because that time I'm talking about 1994 in Slovakia, we had no cocktail bars at all. Well, what was the drinking culture like? You had restaurants, pubs. And that was it. Because so, beer, obviously beer. Is... Correct. So I'm from the southern part of Slovakia. So we got lots of vineyards. My granddad, he used to make 1,000 liters of wine. So he had that much vineyard. So we were surrounded by lots of vineyards. So it was all about wine, beer, and also a distilling spirit. So we were doing exactly the same like in Italy they do with distill anything from uh, fruits. So that was that was our whole culture, really. So the, I can't remember where this video was from, but I just seen a bartender. It's like, so this is the bartender, how does he work? And then they had specs of different cocktails. One of them, I will never forget, was actually the white lady. I was like, that was one of my first it cocktails. It was meant uh, to be. It meant to be. I, was, I could yeah. not believe now when I look back and think, it's like, I remember when I tasted the white lady and I still never forget that. And it had all these ingredients out there. And suddenly I see something green. I was like, what is that? That sounds cool. 
that looks interesting and I've seen it in my life. But it demands, oh my God, this is so salty. That was an olive. <laughs> oh <my laughs> First time in my life I tried an olive. I was like, what on earth is this? So salty and uh, just so unpleasant. That you know, you're 16 years old. Your palate is completely oh. not up for that. So I made our first uh, uh, gin fizz. Then uh, I remember there was a gin fizz. So then there's a silver fizz. Then it's a golden fizz. And this is all in high school? Yeah. In yeah, hospitality in school? In hospitality school. Yeah, yeah. So we, and then when I've seen this all, it's like, oh my God, this is so amazing. And, but you know, when you're young, you were just like, okay, cool. It was interesting that moment. And then we move on. And suddenly I kind of like, Everything else I've seen in the school, it didn't catch my attention. It wasn't that interesting. I like to do that. I did it. So I passed with the, all my exams with distinction. All, all the teachers loved me because everything what I was doing, I did it so precisely and perfectly. But it was just like, okay, I have to do it, right, in order to pass. So I'm going to do it. How about cooking? Same thing. I started a little bit getting more cooking. Oh, yes. Another thing of cooking was when uh, I was actually on my, during my studies that time, I decided to be a vegetarian. And my mom, you know, we are from countryside, we had everything at home, every day you meet. And my mom thought, okay, this is gonna be easy. I'm just gonna stop, I'm just gonna cook always meat. <laughs> but, I love your mom already. <laughs> but I, I was like, that's not gonna be the easy one because I decided to do it in a week when we had a practice. And uh, so I was all week at, uh, at the restaurant and we had staff food. So every time I picked a vegetarian, you know, and I was like, I'm being doing this for one week. There's no way I'm going to go back. And she was just cooking meat, meat, meat. And it's like, okay, there's only one thing I have to do. I have to cook my own. So she let me cook my own food. And I will never forget those first dishes I was cooking. They were so awful. <laughs> and she was just look, watching me and like, there you go. So eat it. And I was forcing myself just to eat it to, in order to like satisfy myself and show her that I can do it. So that was a little bit of cooking part. And back to the bartending. And then so I passed my schools. I went to uh, military service and I came back. So what am I going to do next? So the first thing, the guys, they called me. is like, hey, Erica, we heard that you you studied this. And uh, you're opening a new restaurant. Would you like to join the team? I was like, oh, fantastic. Straight away, I joined the team, started working the restaurant. What town was this? It was in Nitra. It's, how big is that? Nitra is about, it's, it's quite a well-known city because it has three universities. So it's very, very popular uh, a city for students, about 70,000 people. Mm-hmm. What kind of restaurant? A restaurant was, it was kind of a Mediterranean. That's how I remember. Yeah, it was a Mediterranean because I remember the owner, he loved always go to Greece. So that's where I tasted first time a Greek salad and all those dishes which you wouldn't see from my mom cuisine, for example, or anywhere if you go to in in. in I guess more restaurant. more olives. More olives, yeah, yeah. But then I love them. Right. I get the used to them. So and then then I started doing that. I had a little injury because I was still playing football with the, in my back, so I had to slow down. And then uh, another friend of mine called me saying, hey, I've got this pub and I heard you got some problems with bag, but I need a help and you can take it very easy because the pub just got quite busy, so I need some help. So I started working there. It was like an easy job. Well, yeah. Did you always have in your mind the idea of being a bartender yet? So that time it was kind of disappeared. And when I was in that pub, I started strongly thinking, it's like, what am I going to do with my life? I don't want to work in a freaking pub. I want to see the world. So I wanted to go to cruise line. So that was the thing I was always going in my head. It's like, I want to go to cruise line. I want to see the world. I want to travel around the world. So I started looking around into it, looking into it. And all of that just found everywhere. You need to have a good English. And my English was oh. zero. I was like, okay, that won't work. So what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And suddenly... A very good, I was like a regular guest. He was working for Seagram that time. And that pub, it just became such a cool, well-known pub because when it comes to beer, after every single uh, cake, when they finish the draft beer, they clean the pipes. It's no matter how busy it was. The owner had this rules like, once that's finished, you need to clean the pipes in order to start a new beer. The cleanest pipes in Nitra. Big time. Like literally we had people, there was, I remember this guy, he was coming and he was driving 12 kilometers just to come for beer. And he said, I'm a big beer lover. And everywhere I go, I never tasted such a good beer like you have here. 
I was like, oh, really? It's like, yeah. And then I thought, oh, okay, so that's why. So that made me even more be like, okay, I need to follow this every time, make sure that the beer is super perfect. And then with the beer, this guy from Seagram, he started bringing different gins and whiskeys. And so this, for a little pub, it was super exotic for us to see uh, Glenfiddich uh, or Glenlivet. Remember, that was a Glenlivet. We had a Seagram's gin and a uh, few other things. And then he brought this book, big magical black cocktail book. I opened it and I was like, wow, what is this? All like pictures of all the classic cocktails. How is it made? What does it contain? And little story behind it. I was like, this is it. I want to do this. And so translated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, yeah, it was in Czech. Yeah, yeah, it was in Czech yeah. language. So I could understand everything. So I was like, this is perfect. So I got into it. I start, my first cocktail shaker, I remember, he brought us a three-pieces cocktail shaker, which got stuck the top with the, in the middle part. So and that's I, the easy one to yeah. use. <laughs> so we throw it away, that one. So I ended up with the bottom part uh, and my other part. So I turned it into a Boston shaker uh, by using a pine glass. So I had a bottom of the cocktail, three pieces cocktail shaker and a pine glass because I've seen in the video guys using mm -hmm. a Boston shaker, but I've never seen it in real. So I was like, okay, that might work. I put it together, it kind of worked. So I started making some drinks uh, from the book. Well, I have a question about mm. wanting to travel. Yeah. You're in the middle of Europe. I mean, really yeah. in the middle. Had yeah. you visited, say, Vienna, which is somewhat close by that or time, uh, any place like that? I never traveled that time. No. I was eager to go. Mm -hmm. The farthest I went, it was Croatia with my parents for a holiday or Hungary. Nowhere else. Or Prague. That was the max I went. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, no, that time I didn't go to Prague. At Prague I went after when one day I'm on, uh, I'm on a train with a friend of mine who's a musician. So he was reading a Rolling Stones magazine. Let's just drop it on the seat. I pick it up and just like flipping through the pages and one page, a bartender with a cocktail shaker, two bottles and pouring from behind his back into this cocktail shaker. I was like, oh my God, what is this? What is was this? it an ad? So that was an ad for the final cocktail competition of the world, of the best Czech bartenders organized by Beef Eater. I was like... And that must have been really early for a cocktail competition. Yeah, yeah. this was, I tell you exactly when it was, 2000 or 1999. Yeah. I said, oh, I want to see this. So I took a details of that. I went to a travel agency and I told them, so this event is happening in Prague. Could you organize me tickets, accommodation and transport? They sold out everything for me. I went with a camcorder like this, massive piece of camcorder. And I go to this competition. And that was the first time I've seen bartenders in action. And were you still in Nitra this time? So I was in that pub, yeah. Yeah. Still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you just must have gone back and... For me, it was just know. like, I couldn't breathe. Nobody could talk to me. And we're just like filming, recording everything. Came home and I was just watching all over again that bartenders how they work how they were doing a little bit of flair making cocktails because the competition was very complex that they had a different rounds I was like this is exactly what I want this is what I want to do did you feel then that you knew that kind time? of the steps to get to what, how you wanted not exactly wanted but I knew that this is what I want to do okay that was just like okay remember when I was thinking what I'm going to do in my life mm -hmm. that was the moment it's like I know what I want to do in my life I just need to find out how I'm going to get there so I started doing research about bartending schools. Only what I found in Slovakia was uh, com the bar school organized by under IBA. So I contacted them and was like, what kind of uh, trainings are you providing and offering? And uh, all what I found was just like very basics. But they were talking so highly that once you finish, you get an international certificate. It's like, what I got a certificate for when you teach me probably nothing. Yeah. Because what I've seen, it was just very basic. We show you a video, it's like, I have video. I don't want to watch video, I want action. I want to touch the shaker, I want to know how to work with it and learn all the tricks. It's like, this is not what I want. And in that book, suddenly I just discovered on the last page of that big magical cocktail book, the Roman Ulish who wrote that book, he was actually having his own bartending school. So it was on the last page. So I just took the number, phoned him up, and I said, hello. My name is Eric. I want to bartender. I want to be bartender. I want to learn how to flare. Bang! He put the phone down. 
What's wrong? <laughs> the F maybe word. the maybe, maybe, <laughs> F word, but not the naughty one, right, just the exactly flare. Word. flare. <laughs> I was like, okay, let me try again because calling to Czech Republic, maybe it is the connection. Phone him straight away, and he goes, he was very straightforward. It's like, listen, I don't teach flare. I know how to show you, but I'm here to teach people how to make cocktails. So, hey, hey, hey that's what I want, that's what I want. Okay, next month, I started a three month course. It was like, perfect. I mean, what do I need to do? He sent me all the details. I came back to the pub. I told the guys, like, guys, I'm leaving. I'm going to Prague learning about bartending. Oh, so the owner said, yeah, hey, okay, fine, fine, fine. I was like, when well, I'm resigning, I was like, what do you mean? It's like, it's for three months. What kind of three months? It's like, yeah, it's a proper school for Monday to Friday for three months. You know, I need to resign. I need to go there. Took all my savings. I went, hair like this, up to my shoulder. First day at school. In a, in a, in a, How many people were in the school? I think there were... It was like eight of us, eight, but there was one. As I said, he was very straightforward. And he's seen, uh, so there was one company, they sent four employees there. And uh, after two or three weeks, he phoned the company saying, three of the guys who you send, they can stay, but the fourth, I will never turn him into a bartender. <laughs> oh, oh, poor guy. <laughs> he was like that. It's like, I can see him that he is, uh -huh. this is not for him. Okay. So I just like, I really don't want you to waste the money just to pay him. So I, this is not for him. So that dropped out. And Did so, you know immediately I am in so the right place? Yeah, that time uh, it was everything new. And it's like, okay, I see something completely new. What I wanted. Suddenly I hold the Boston shake, a real Boston shake in my hand. I remember I could not open it because I couldn't figure out how to open it. And the first thing was that... Uh, he goes first he told me like, if you want to be a bartender you need to cut your hair straight next day I came back with a short hair I was like oh okay I like that guy <laughs> <laughs> and then he showed us the book which I had already saying this book contains all the classic cocktails you have to know if you want to be a bartender this book will be in your head and make sure that after three months I'll get this book into your head I was like okay step behind the bar day, on the behind the bar day two and he showed us five cocktails. Following day, he showed us another five cocktails. And then he asked each of us to go behind the bar. So I go behind the bar and he said, okay, make me Manhattan, you make me Rob Roy, and you make me Whiskey Sour. And I go, Rob, 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 Rob Roy, what was that? Something whiskey based. And then he just shoot me another drink. And I was just like, completely confused. I was just, like, I didn't know what I'm doing. I was like, oh my God, I've got such a minestrone soup from this. <laughs> so he made it clear, like, listen, you need to study. You need to study the recipes by everything. The measure, the glass, the garnish, the methods. And when I say name, you have to know everything about that drink. It's like, okay. I went back, I was like, I can't lose this opportunity. I went back home. I was waking up with the, school, with the book and I was going to sleep with the book. And I was reading it all over, all over, all over again. And after a couple of weeks, he seen like, okay, this guy is taking it really seriously. So it's like, okay, I've got, a, I've got a job for you because I've got also agency. So I'm doing like catering, like cocktail caterings. And you can come with me. It's like, okay, perfect. So it works for me so I can see some action. It was a bit cool because I've seen him, how he interact with people. I see how he work. I see how he was. And I remember my first event with him, obviously first time doing it. So I just like, he goes, Eric, give me some ice. I came with the ice bucket and I just like, tried to pour it in. But it was, it was, it was very rough. It was like, Pour the ice quickly, and so I put it quickly in, into the ice bucket and into the speed run and everywhere on his knees, on his legs. Oh my god! And it's like every pass me a uh, grapefruit juice, so pass him orange juice. He made a drink. What are you doing? Pass him back. I gave him a sugar. The sugar drops down and made so much mess. So what he did next day? He did a complete debrief in front of everyone. So guys, so just to let you know, yesterday Eric came with me for this event. And then he just went on and on and on. And I was just like, oh, my God. So I was just like, I was a big laugh for the guys. A great teacher, though. But yeah, super, yeah. super. He was super hard on me. And, and I, and in a way, it kind of hurt me. But in a other way, way, I see that he doesn't want to do bad things to me. Right, he to fair. Me the, hard but fair. Yeah, hard but fair. Exactly. Uh -huh. So I was like, okay, I just need to work even harder on myself. And then he see that slowly I picked up everything. And then uh, it was a moment when I did event with him and he had two cars. I was driving one. He was driving another one through Prague and just like chasing each other because like, I can't lose him. I can't lose him in this big city. 
<laughs> and then we had so much fun together. It's like, okay, now you got it. It's like, right. And then he goes, so now I'm consulting a cocktail bar in Bratislava. So, oh, in your city, in your hometown, not in your hometown, in your home country. And they're looking for a bartender. So on a Friday, you go there. He's like, Phew, okay. So I went with, uh, went with him. He introduced me to the owner. Stayed behind the bar, dark, wooden floor, the black bar, big pyramid, lots of bottles behind, and two guys behind the bar. It's like, hello, hello, nice to meet you. Put me behind the bar, give me a couple of orders when they came up, started making drinks, my hands were completely shaking. And I was like, okay, is this really, this is how it's going to be? Or I'm just like, not used to it. And he said, like, no, just keep going, just keep going. So I did. Friday night, did the Saturday nights, and the owner came to me. Would you like to come next Friday as well? I was like, sure. So I came next Friday, and then they see me that I'm still young. I was still at the beginning of the school, so it was completely different, like facing customers or guests and orders and suggesting. I wasn't ready for that. So he was like, okay, why don't we start this? I'd like you to come, but it will be our bar back first. Like, okay, fine. At least something. Doing the preps squeezing limes, picking mints and doing all that. I was very happy to do that. So I was going for three months every Friday from Prague, six hours by train, come to uh, to Bratislava. I run straight, go behind the bar. I work Friday night, work Saturday night. Sunday around five in the morning, I took the first train to Nitra, to my hometown. I arrived like seven in the morning, see my parents. And at midnight, I had a night bus back to Prague, which was like eight hours. So I arrived to Prague, straight to school, and then... But your school was only three months, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was doing oh, it for boy. three months, oh, all around, all around. And after when I finished the school, I passed all the exams as I had to, so I was very happy. I was very happy with because I've learned everything. It was good that I was always working during the weekend, and uh, plus with him... So I passed the exams. He was very happy with that. And then uh, uh, the, the owner of the Greenwich, he just offered me a job. He's like, so you finish your school, you can start working. He's like, with a pleasure. And what was Bratislava like then? At that time, it was the cocktail scene did not exist either. So that was the first cocktail bar which introduced the mojito, which introduced the dry martini, the Negroni, the Mai Tai. How long had it been in existence before you started working there? A three months, two months. So, so it was very early. new. It was very yeah. new. So when I started, in I started, I think in October. They opened in November, and I joined them in December. So because he opened, I remember the owner. He opened it on his birthday, and his birthday is in November, and I joined them just right after Christmas. And Greenwich, it was Greenwich, called Greenwich. Greenwich, Greenwich Cocktail Bar. Do you think because of the links to Greenwich Village or yeah, Greenwich, yeah. England? No, Greenwich Village because our logo was basically a, a big clock or watch. And it says Greenwich Cocktail Bar. And when you walk into the bar, you had Greenwich time on the wall. You had a Bratislava time on another part of the wall with a big clock. And then you had New York time, Tokyo time. And that was just a kind of theme to it. To so make it mm. more like a... Because we wanted to do uh, uh, cocktails and the owner, he was working with one designer and he thought cocktail is very uh, American versus uh, English, British. So they kind of found the link between that. So bring some kind of British style. It was so your thing. You must have been so excited. I was because for me it was like, oh my God. But the thing was that when we started in that bar, that was the only one first cocktail bar in town. And when people came in and they just like, this is amazing. They told to their friends, they came. And did they, they know what to order? I mean, or should I say, what, what kind of thing did they At the order beginning, the no, they were just all curious to try different things. And then lots of people realized that they really loved rum. So we were very big on rum, rum cocktails, like Mai Tai, Mojito. We were doing like hundreds of mojitos a day. And that's become just like a hub of rich and famous all the celebrities. I remember when uh, Slovakia won World Cup in ice hockey, the hockey players straight from this, uh, from the airport, they came to us. They were celebrating the victory they all with the gold medal. So it was like, this is unbelievable. So much fun, it, was, it was like, wow, I'm living a dream. This is like, <laughs> I watched them on the TV and now I'm just making them drinks here. And they had all much, so much fun. 
Now, so, now you you said you saw this this uh, you went to the competition. Hmm. Um, were you ever thinking that yet that you could compete? Not that time. Not that time. Not that time. Even though I was told to do competitions, and I said I'm not ready. I don't feel to show something there. So I just like I need to more work, more focus on work and learn things because I still find that I'm I'm only a young bartender, like young bartender. I just finished the school and I just started here. But the thing what's happened after uh, one summer the owner came and he said, "Okay, guys, I've got a, two friends. They work in the winter time in Alps and the summer they are free. So and I know them." And they're bartenders, they're cool, very good bartenders. So I bring them here so they will work with us during the summer. Guess who walks in when he said, tonight the guy, I'm going to bring them in. The bartender who was in the Rolling Stone magazine advertisement. Oh my god! I was like, I cannot believe him. <laughs> so we become one of the best friends. And it's still today. We keep saying the same story. Like, I remember when you came, and I came to the bar, you were behind the bar, so nervous. And then I started working with it him. It was so meant to be. It's so meant oh. to be. <laughs> And he gave me so much confidence because he was like speaking foreign languages and uh, he working abroad. So I could see that the way how he talk with people, the way how he take orders, he was just like, wow, amazing. So I learned so much from him. We become such a great friends, started doing events with him, like some amazing events, even the bar itself, because the owner, he, he knew everyone, everyone knew him. We did a private party for a guy who was celebrating his birthday. He came on his private helicopter. His business partner gave him Lamborghini. And I was there making drinks for all these people on a castle that he hired it for all his friends. And it was like bottomless Dom Perignon serve for everyone through the whole night long, just to start with. Plus the cocktails and the helicopter and this Lamborghini. And it's like everyone who was rich and famous... They were there on that party when I was well, serving them. A lot of people would have just been really happy to stay there. Yes. You know, so it that sounds was it. like so it for me was, was, I kind of want to go there right now. So for <sighs> me, it was like I was living my dream. But more I was working there. And because I became a very close friend to the owner, he didn't even take me as an employee. He was taking me like a friend. I was going out with him with his family for dinners and going on holidays. Like I was doing everything with him. Like... I spend my morning through the whole day with him. Like he goes, okay, I want to see this restaurant in in Prague. Sat in the car, went to Prague just to have a lunch, and came back same day. <laughs> and he was like this. He's so into it. But then I found out that he was giving me kind of responsibilities of run. He opened another restaurant, another place, not like a bar slash coffee place. And that wasn't really like it was great. Because it was new, again, very interesting, nice concept. But I was so young and I was having such a responsibilities that you would do when you are like, I don't know, 30 and you got like, okay, I'm, I'm done with cocktails, I'm done with that. I just want to sort out the papers and let the things work. And it's like, I'm too young for this. I still want to learn, I still want to see. And I've got, and I know I've got so much to learn. So that time I found like, okay, I'm kind of burning out. And in order to top this one up, I was like, I need to leave Slovakia. Because right now, for me, I conquered the Bratislava and there was nothing else where I could go. And I never went anywhere else for anyone else working. Even if it was a moment, there was another bar where they opened, like our biggest competitors, they wanted to. They wanted to offer me a job. So I was on on one leg, I was like about to go. But then I was like, no, I don't, I don't want to go. I just stay. So I was become loyal to him, but it's like the only one way to to leave is just leave the country. And I was like, that's the only one way. I, I feel okay with that. And uh, I wanted to see. And the first thing was, then I started doing more and more research about bartending and everything came out in English. And a good friend of mine, Stan Madrina, he already was like traveling here and there. And he was coming back from London quite often. And he was telling me about this bar and that bar and this book, and he could speak pretty well English. I was like, damn, okay, I need this. I need to get this done. I was like, I can't learn English here. I need to learn English in a speaking country. So I was making a decision between US, Australia, or UK. UK was the last because it was the weather. I've got nothing exciting about UK. It was like, I found New York or Sydney. Even though he was telling you that the bars were so cool and all Still that? Still not. I don't know. Because mm -hmm. I, I when I seen any pictures about Australia or New York, it was more fascinating. Yeah. And New about York, London, I didn't see anything 
wow, for some reason. But I got like a guest came into the bar. It's like, oh, I've got this bar I've been to. It's the longest bar in, a, in, in the world. It's called the Long Bar and it's in London. So, okay, Long Bar. Wait, now what down. year was this? About. This was 2002, 2003. Okay. So it was just starting the yeah, kind yeah, yeah, yeah. of cocktail culture. Yeah. So, I was yeah, like, Sanderson Long Bar. Yeah. One so, of the, you know, first. So I said, okay, I think I need to go. So our second bar was right next to a travel agency. I went to the travel agency. It was like, <laughs> okay. It's you again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like uh, what kind of uh, language schools are you offering? So they gave me a brochure and they was like, we do this, we do that, we do that. And I looked at the prices like, okay, Australia, pretty costly, very far away, visa, very difficult. US, exactly the same. Yeah. I was like, okay, London is kind of manageable. But again, the visa. And uh, as was the bar, it was a travel agency and next to that was the British Embassy. And those guys, they were always coming to the bar. And suddenly one day they said, like, oh, by the way, it's like, what's, what's the situation with the visas? Like, oh, it's not official yet, but from next week, uh, Slovakia's visa will be cancelled for, for UK. You can free travel without visa. I was like, really? It's like, okay. Oh, the best timing. Best decision made. <laughs> <laughs> Went back to the agency. Okay, so like, next okay. week, fuck it. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go. It was 2004, January. I booked my language school for six months in London. I paid in cash. So doing Slovakia at that time. <laughs> so they gave me a free uh, free ticket to to London by bus. I was like, okay, saving some oh money. God. I do that. Obviously, bus broke down halfway through. It took me two days to come to <laughs> London. The longest bus ride ever. <laughs> but when I was resigning, when I was selling to the owner, to Carol, Carol Sass, I was like, Carol, I made my decision. I want to learn English and I want to go to London. No, what do you mean? How do I? I? It's like, yeah, I'm resigning and I'm leaving in January and I want and I want to learn. So he was super upset with me. He didn't talk with me for uh -huh. two days. So then after two days, he's like, still not friend. And can you just extend for a few more weeks? It's like, okay, so extend a few more weeks. So I think I came in February. So, which means in next month will be, uh, what, 2020? 16 years from here. So, I left in February. Did you have any idea where you would work or? No, no, any, no, no. No, nothing. Just so you have to was, it and you're in going to was prepaid school for six months. I paid accommodation with the family for one month. I was like, this is good for a start and then we'll see how it goes. So, I came here and... Uh, Went to a school that was a language school in Camden Town, TTI. Very good school. Learn a lot. Mark was an amazing teacher. And there, right next door was a news agent. So I went to the news agent was like, uh, I'm looking for a bar guide. And I found an amazing bar guide. And nice pictures, address, what is the bar about. Couldn't understand because it was all in English. But at least I see the pictures and address. So what I started doing with this bar guide, every Friday after school, I just went out. I just went to one bar, two bar, third bar. I just sat on the bar as a customer or a guest. Had a drink, looked around, cool. I remember I went to, what was the lab? I went to Townhouse. That was the two like famous bars. And then some, there were some clubs as well, bougies. And then I found this called the Attica. And I never could find it. Every time I was like, during the week around, and I never could find it. Until one day, I was passing by with my colleague, with my schoolmate. I was like, wow, this is it. Because they were during the week, they were closed. So the club was always opening on Thursday, Friday and Saturday. So that's the place I always wanted to see because it looks so cool in the pictures. So I just like, I want to go in and this big security guy is like, booking. I was like, whoa, booking? No booking, just for drink. <laughs> and the guy goes, 20 pounds each. And that time, 20 pounds was like, Still, just to go into a club, 20 pounds. A lot, yeah. but that time the currency was 1 to 20. Oh. Slovakian crown, 1 pound was at uh, 50 Slovakian crowns, which was my one hour salary. <laughs> so it's like, like it's like 20 it, hours right? of salary, 20 hours of work just to walk in. Mm -hmm. So I turned back and was like, man, he wants 20 pounds from each? And he's like, the guy was like, no, he wasn't a partner. I said, no, I'm not going to do it. No, no yeah. way. So he's seen that we kind of hesitating. So he just like put his hands. He's like, okay, 15. 
He's like, that's much better. So, you know, I'll pay. I'll pay him, give him 30 pounds. We walked in, walked into this amazing club. I was like, wow, this looks so cool. First time in a proper real club, massive Onyx bar, six stations, six bartenders behind. I was like, wow, this is something amazing. I looked around, I was like, what I need to do is just like, I, th I think this is a place I want to work. More so than lab. Yeah. I don't know, for some reason, lab, uh, I didn't find it that time. Now, if you ask me, I would go straight to lab. Right. But that time, uh, I don't know. It didn't catch my attention. When I went to the, club, the bar, Attica, I was so impressed by everything. And I still remember that. Still with broken English. So I had written sentences on the paper. Hi, I'm bartender. I'm looking for a job. This is true. So I pull it out. It's like, okay, what I need to do, I need to find behind the bar a guy who is wearing a suit because he will be a manager. So just looking around, looking around, and I said, ah, that must be him. So, excuse me. I'm a bartender. I'm looking for a job. And he, through the night, imagine middle of the night, I was like, how on earth you can ask something like that? Like today, if someone would ask me, it's like, there's a door, here's the menu, you can have a drink, or there's a door, that's it. I ask him and he says, like, come tomorrow at 8 o'clock. Did he say 8 o'clock tomorrow? I show up tomorrow at 8 o'clock. It's like very black. I showed up. And he's like, okay, this is super exciting. I might get a job here. And I got in. And there was this guy called Xim from Kosovo. I said, you knew? He's like, yes. Okay, take this, polish that, bring that, take that. So I started doing what he was telling me. He's like, okay, fine started doing what I have to do. What happened was, the guy asked the manager, he went on a holiday on that day, following day, and he never handed over anything about me. So the assistant manager, Llewellyn, South African guy, suddenly just like keeps staring at me, and he's like, why does that guy keep staring at me? So after a couple of minutes, he comes like, hey you, just point out his finger like, come with me. And we're going out from the bar, through the long corridor into the fire exit. It was like, he's sorry, do you want to stab me here? What's going on? And with his South African accent, he just went on me. Who are you? What are you doing? How did you get here? But as he was asking, I couldn't understand a word from him. He was like, what on earth are you asking? I don't even know what language you're speaking. So I just looking at him. So he goes like, have you worked in a bar? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what to do? Yeah, yeah, go back. That you know it's it. funny. I interview a lot of Italians. Yeah, and of yeah, course, yeah. there's so many Italian bartenders and people in hospitality that mm. they have no problem coming and yeah, yeah. finding some place to work because everyone speaks yeah. Italian. But it's not this as one. if no, you, know, you have a check. Say, it's like oh, <laughs> super. Like okay, what so else? Tough. What's going to be next? What's going to be next? So I started. So I started uh, the role was the lowest of the lowest position you can have, possible because I couldn't even properly speak English, and he realized that like. But you, no I guess you were okay with that. Super happy. It's like, uh. I've got a job. So then he asked me, he's like, okay, you're good. Bring me your passport. I'll bring your passport. He's like, do you have visa? And I said, no. <laughs> Another one. <laughs> and he just laughed at me. He was like, what? But like, I don't have work visa, but I think I can do it as a student a couple hours. So that kind of fits. Because the bar was open only Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So it was like that didn't break the that amount of hours I wasn't able to do. It's like, okay, fine. Signed a contract, and I started. During the day, I was going to language school, came home, prepared some dinner, had some relax, and I went to the club. Always a shift started, I think, at 8.30. Club calls at 3. By the time we finished, was 5. Get home, 5.30, 6. 10 o'clock morning, back at school. But For how after, long? So... I found this job on the second month I was here and my school was for six months. So for four so, months you did this? At the beginning I was okay, mm -hmm. but the bars got sometimes got busier weeks, so we were open more, so I was working more hours. And I remember there was two hours today and I was just like filling asleep in the hours on the, on, the, on the lessons. How long were you there before you got to do proper bartending? So on the floor I started, I think I was like six months, just on the floor. After six months, he put me behind the bar. So I was like, okay, this is much better. And then I just kind of started looking like, what's the bartender's like? What they do? How much they know about what they do? 
So I started asking questions. I picked up something. I was like, what is this? And he just picked it up. He's like, oh, it's kind of liquor from America. I'm like, okay. He didn't tell me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and you have these like 500 cocktails in your head I need everything. Right? You know everything I just couldn't express myself <laughs> so I just uh, I was just doing a little help sometimes just like touch the shaker did a little grief here and there I was like oh you worked as a bartender before I was like yeah, yeah, yeah I remember I think one day was one of the bartenders got sick or something so they put me on a verse station on this long onyx six stations bar and the verse by me that's there was a column right in the middle of the station and there was just like mirrors around. So when I was standing on my station, I was staring at myself in a mirror and I had a guest from my left hand side and on my right hand side. It's only two people. That's all I could serve. So that was like a slowest, mm -hmm. more, most boring station. But I was like, it's my first shift. So they couldn't put me anywhere else. But I said, it's not going to stop me. And I remember they put me there. I did a good job. I did another good job. So that's become kind of my station until one day we had a party and each of us had our own micros work on his own cards so each has our own reports and this part was amazing that i made so much fun with these guys contacts and i was just selling them bottles of champagne and as the manager was going through each tills at the end of the night he was doing reports and there was a, we had a section called the points and that was the most skilled bartender was working the head bartender and then was the, the mirror station, which was the most boring one. And as he, report, he prints out all the reports and he look, what are you doing on point? Look at him. I made 5,000 pound sales on that. He made 3,000 pounds on the busiest one. He was like, how is this possible? What did you do? He was like, I'm serving. So the manager, what he did is like, okay, next Friday, you on point. He's like, oh my God, I'm on a point. So he put me on a point. But I says like, okay, this opportunity to show. So I was on a point and I was just like, this is my night. So I just did the best night, I did the best sales. I was super happy and then I never left. That became my station. So the head bartender was kicked out by the bartender. And then he realized like, okay, maybe it's a time to change, time to move. Oh, and then you know what the bad feelings yeah, there the but whole was time. Like, that wasn't my decision. Uh -huh. He told me to do that and I just did it. But they were okay with that. And then it's like, so did you work as a bartender? It's like, yeah. And then I started telling them the stories like, really, you did this, you did that? It's like, yeah. So then kind of I earned my... At that point at Attica, were you able... Or were you even thinking about, say, creativity? Or were you just cranking out the cocktails? Just that was just like the few signature cocktails and lots of vodka Red Bulls, lots of rum and coke. And I tried to bring the cocktails in. And then uh, then a year later, a very good friend of mine from Slovakia, Marian Becker, calls me. He's like, hey, Eric, I'm coming to London. And the first thing, you got a job? No. Okay. So I went to Llewellyn, the bar manager said, Llewellyn, do you need another guy? Yeah, 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 of course, bring, 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 bring. So I was bringing him all the guys I need. <laughs> so Marion became a, our team member. So, and he'd seen him like, okay, he's one of yours. He's like, yeah, yeah, he's very good. So as soon as he learned English, he became our a bartender. Mm -hmm. So we run the bar, the whole show together. And then we realized like, okay, this is not for us anymore. It's a nightclub. We wanted to do cocktails. And they were like 10 people enjoy the cocktails and the rest were just like, give me a bottle of vodka, a bottle of whiskey, a bottle of champagne. So what happened was... But by that time, you must have known what London held as far as cocktails and bars. That time I started discovering it. Yes, mm -hmm. that's right. So that was the first kind of thing like, okay, something going on here that uh, it make me stay. I don't want to go back home because the plan was come here for six months because that's what mm -hmm. I told my owners, like six months, I'll stay here. And then I come back, I learn English and I come back. But then I realized, like, hold on a second, I've got more opportunities here. And then I discovered there is like a, another bar and another bar and another ingredients. That was another thing. Like I've started discovering ingredients that I never came across back in Slovakia. Like when I was in Slovakia, we had to bring a mint from Vienna. People didn't have mint there at that time. When we started, we were making mojito, we had to go to Vienna mm -hmm. to buy mints and to Prague to buy limes. <laughs> So for us, was uh, all those things were super mm. exotic. And all the ingredients which I've seen here, super standard over there, was like Peugeot Bidez, first time here. And then I was like, okay, this is kind of a cool thing. So then I discovered the Class Magazine. I started reading about that. And then I said, okay, there's some kind of competitions. Do you remember any of the bars that really influenced you at that time? Mm. Uh, bars... Uh, we were going, uh, so with Marian, we always were kind of touring around 
And I think the big one was when the Montgomery place opened. So I knew, yeah. I at that time we had the, that was the Drink Boy chat. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ted, Ted Hess, I think it was like. So they were set up the Dream Boy chat, so I was on it reading resources. And I remember Nidal Ramini was sourcing for Cupid glasses for his Montgomery Place bar. It's like, Montgomery Place, okay. Cupid, and I was like, that's something very different. And I searched about this Montgomery Place, and I was like, okay, this was like a very cool bar. So I told Marian, I was like, Marian, let's go have a look at this Montgomery Place. There's a new bar in Nutting Hill. So we went, ah, and before Montgomery Place, yeah, there was uh, Lonsdale. That was the one. Right. That was the one with the uh, rest in peace, uh, Henry Besson. And when he opened that, we went there. It was like, wow, this is amazing. That was the... Then we started going out for cocktails. And then we discovered he got a hotel bars as well. So when every time when one of us has a birthday, we did this little rituals. Like, so we went to Ritz, had a martini, or we went to Savoy, had a white lady, and so on, going around. Did you happen to meet Argo in Montgomery Place then? Yeah, yeah. so I met Argo. Actually, I gotta remember our first visit because he said uh, when we went there, <laughs> when we went there, I showed this to Marian, and uh, Marian stole the menu because he'd seen it, he loved it so much, and he's like, when you guys came first time, I remember I gave you menus, and then I just got one back. It's like, yeah, Marian took one <laughs> because he loved it so much, and Marian straight away after he applied for a job, uh-huh. because he loved that, so he he started working this, and then we become old friends. We all left uh, Attica, we went to different, where we were, I actually, before Attica, we went down the road here and uh, we were doing a few shifts at the living room, living room just opened here on Headland Street and that was the flagship. So we were, we were there and... Uh, was there one place that you thought, I, I have to work there? No, no, that no. was just like, uh, I wanted to get out from a nightlife, night bar because it was just like so late. And I couldn't see any creativity going on mm-hmm. there when I've seen when I went to Lonsdale or went to Montgomery or Trailer Happiness was there as well. So it's like, okay, I need to find a good bar, like a proper cocktail program. And Marian had some contacts there. So it's like, let's go just do a couple of shifts, at least fill up the week. So we started going there for part time. And I always had this influence by Japanese culture, but by just by reading. And then I discovered here the amazing Japanese restaurant. So I. I first time try sushi here and I was like this is so pure beautiful and everything just makes all sense about that culture and one day I was passing by a Bishan place and there was the Japanese restaurant called Nozomi I was like this is amazing I really would love to work here one day and what happened was that that restaurant was set up by the same owner who used to have the club at the beginning so I had some contacts there because the general manager moved and uh, and they, he introduced me to people. It's just like, they're looking for a bar and they go and have a look. So I went. They put me behind the bar and it's like, okay. For that was like serious cocktail program, using sake in cocktails, using fresh fruits in cocktails, using homemade ingredients, lot from the uh, Japanese cuisine. It was like, this is exactly, I would love to work. And such a nice environment, great place, great location. So I did the trial shift. General manager didn't like me. But the bar manager liked me. So the bar manager after she said, you got a job. And I remember it's like, so he called me back. So I, I remember I'm eating, I'm having a lunch on a, before a shift the following day. And the general manager see me there. It's like, and he says so loud to the bar manager, what is he doing here? I was like, oh my God, what a oh, no. <laughs> So he called me on the side. They're having a chat. He came back. It's like, don't worry, you, you stay. And I felt so awkward. It's like, okay, yeah. so air is not so clear here but I was like okay I just do my best so I went behind the bar and he said that uh, he asked me to make something I can't remember what drink was that some kind of drink so I made the drink I passed it on to him it was a bar manager called Fassi he tasted it I was like wow I never tasted such a balanced cocktail there's no way you're not gonna you you uh, there's no way that you you will uh, you will stay here so you you won't go you won't uh, you will stay here for sure it's no matter yeah. so he backed me up and then we become friends and it was cool so I was two years there and again so it was like okay I worked in a night bar a co- cocktail bar I worked in a restaurant bar worked in a nightclub where I would like to work at it's it's 
it's a hotel bar because here the hotel bars they are so well known they are for, so frequently visited by people who are not residents and that time was when we with Marianne we were going around hotel bars and we kind of think it's like you think this is the job you want to work because when we looked around that time in the hotel bars they were all like very older people very old schools like if you're so young by mind but you might get so old by just like, being here so it's like this is not what we want probably to do but uh, so I came across uh, actually you no know, Marian introduced me to Giuseppe Gallo because Giuseppe Gallo used to live in Westborough Grove and he was his regular at Montgomery Place and he was looking for a bartender and he was a supervisor of the of the uh, Purple Bar at the Sanderson Hotel and that time already I made my first trip to Japan. I discovered Japan, bars there, bartenders, how they work in tiny little bars, cutting the ice and making the perfect martinis. Like everything was just wow, 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 wow. This is what I really wanted to see. And then uh, Marian goes like, hey, you should meet Giuseppe. He's looking for a bartender in this uh, hotel. Because I told him, it's like, okay, I, I got enough of the restaurant because it started turning into almost like a party bar and I've got enough of that. So I made up with Giuseppe, I show up on an interview and I still remember you saying, it's like, the way how you carry yourself on an interview is like, this was the guy I was looking for, perfectly dressed. And when I went to bar show, I watched you there, you were recording everything, making notes about everything. I was like, this is what I wanted to have in my team. So I did my interview. And when I when he showed me first time the purple bar, I was like, wow, this is exactly the bar I could kind of try to do the things, implement the things I've seen in Japan because I brought the ice block. I remember first time I called Eskimo. I think this was 2004. No, 2005, six. I called Eskimo company that I want ice block because I've seen the ice block using in Japan. They, they had no idea what I want. Probably today they bought a private island, the amount of ice blocks they <laughs> sold. And I said, I just want a plain block of ice. I was like, what do you mean? Why do we do statues? I'm like, yeah, yeah, things where you do statues from, butterflies, whatever, just do me the plain block of ice. And they costed like 150 pounds. It's like, come on, it's just a frozen water. Do me a better price. So I managed to negotiate a proper price. So they brought me a block of ice. So and the Nozomi was the first, probably the first bar in England that had uh, ice block served uh, drinks on an uh, ice, uh, crystal clear ice cube. And then uh, I was like, I cannot do it here. It's too messy. People didn't much care about it. And uh, when I came to the purple bar, it's like, this is a perfect bar. It's calm, small, just like those Japanese bars. I was like, okay, I want to work here. So obviously I passed through all the interviews with Giuseppe. And Giuseppe was like, okay, first time I'm working with someone who's really into that. He drives the bar. It was a vodka bar, so we had like 150 vodkas, but it's like, but lots of time people came in and they just, they didn't want to drink vodka. So me and him, we built the whole entire back bar that we created a nice category of rums, of whiskeys, of gins. Mm -hmm. And we turned it another, like a secretly another bar because the main concept was vodka bar. That's how it was known. But under the vodkas, we, I built shelves made of uh, uh, champagne boxes where I put all these bottles out so we could do other cocktails as well rather than just non-stop vodka drinks. And how did you feel working in a hotel? It was great. So it was, uh, again, so it was like a new experience. It was like, I love that. It was amazing. But then shortly I discovered that that place has been there now already like eight years. And now again, it was like a, it meant to be because I ended up working in the bar, which the guest told me back in Slovakia, long bar wrote one right. of the longest bar and I was like I had it all written down and now I'm working here I was just in other bar it was like amazing so then I kind of started having an idea where I want to work it's like okay where I want to work is I want to work in a bar where I will be part of the opening team because till today every time I was working somewhere it was I just jump on the running train where it was going fast or slow and this was like they made a concept and I just had to follow it was either good or not as good. And I was like, I want to be a part of a team where I come in with a team of people who are equally into it as I am, and then we create something, and this will be our concept. And That doesn't happen very often. Right? But when I've got something in my mind, I just follow, and I just don't stop. So, so how long did it take to find not that? Not too long, because what happened was we were just kind of... 
uh, debating with one of the bartenders from the long bar, Ricardo Semeria. And he goes like, hey, uh, you heard that the Connaught's bar is reopening and they're looking for stuff. He's like, what? Connaught? Connaught Hotel? The one in the Mayfair? He's like, yeah, 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 I just went and did my interview. He's like, can you pass me the contact? So he passed me a contact to Santino Cicciari. He's like, hey, Santino, I got your contact from Ricardo and I'm, uh, I'm looking for a bar job opportunity. Maybe we can have a chat. And I'll never forget when I had the first meeting with him. He was like, so Eric, tell me, why are you chasing me? <laughs> Still remember, like, why are you chasing me? It's like, you know, I'm, I worked here, I worked there, I worked there. What I'm, and I was very honest. It's like, I had other pictures. Like, what I'm looking for, I want a part of the team where everyone is very into it. And we can create something new together. And he was just listening, listening, listening. I was like, okay. It's the things I like about this guy. I was like, okay. So what is the deal? Who works here? Who will be in the team? And then he said, I can see you're pretty serious about this job. It's not official yet, so it's very confidential. But uh, I'm still waiting till the mister make his decision to become head bartender. And who is he? Ago Perón. I was like, oh, my God. It was just as hard for me to stop there as it was for you. Still, it was cocktail hour and I was thirsty. Don't worry. We return next week with more from Eric. But now I have to have my Cocktail of the Week. The Cocktail of the Week is one of Eric's fabulous creations. The Heads and Tails, a smoky and sweet wonder. Add all of the following ingredients to a mixing glass. 25 ml of Vita Mezcal. 25 ml of Beer Mouth. Google that. 3 drops of Peixos Bitters and 10 mls of agave nectar. Stir and then strain into a glass. Then top with genmacha soda and garnish with crispy cavolo nero. You'll find this recipe, more mezcal recipes, and all the cocktails of the week at alushlifemanual.com where you'll also find all the ingredients in our shop. I'm always inspired by those who knew what they wanted to do when they grew up and put their head down and achieved even more than they thought possible. I was a faffer until I found myself writing about drinks, but it took a while and thank goodness I found it. If you live for Lush Life, would you consider supporting us by buying us a coffee? Just go to buymeacoffee.com slash Lush Life. And you can donate once or monthly to make sure we are still here every Tuesday. Theme music for Lush Life is by Stephen Shapiro and used with permission. And Lush Life is always and will be forever produced by Evo Terra and Simpler Media Productions. Which leaves me to say the wise words of Oscar Wilde, all things in moderation, including moderation, and always drink responsibly. Okay, the second part was mine. So... Next time on Lush Life, we return to speak with Eric Lawrence as he is about to step into the Connaught Hotel and change it from the sleepy bar it was to the best bar in the world. Until that time, bottoms up.